Hello and welcome to the CSU podcast. I'm going to be your host for today and the topic is Marc de Trot, Belgium's Dirty Secret. I just want to begin this by saying the 90s was a scary time in Belgium. Every summer, you would have a few disappearances, usually children and usually girls. And it almost seemed like the police had a culture of being lax about this. A child disappearances are no joke, so this is why this case infuriates me. A child goes missing. Why are you not plastering their faces on every news outlet? Why are you not starting a search for them immediately? But no, the Belgian police would tell parents, wait 48 hours, and if the child has not come back, come back to us then. And we all know that the first 24 hours of a child's disappearance are the most crucial. It is in those first 24 hours that a child is most likely to be killed by his abductor. Would it not make sense for the police to begin a search immediately? But no, in this case, the police wasted as much time as possible. Disappearances went, uh, disappearances were ignored by these policemen. It was almost as if they were not important enough. Or were they covering up for something greater? One of the first few disappearances was that of Anne and Evia. They had gone off on holiday. The next day they'd, they didn't arrive home and another of their friends called their father, Paul Marshall, and said that they hadn't turned home. Now, Paul, understandably, extremely frightened and scared, went over to the police. However, the police, he said, were disinterested. They said that the girls would show up and the case went unsolved for a while. Now, however, it wasn't unusual for that summer. There were a lot of other girls that had gone missing and other families that had been devastated. This is what's extremely baffling about this case. It had been almost a phenomenon at the time that girls were going missing in broad daylight. And yet the police did not stop to think that, oh, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe this is connected. You know, there there had been almost around six disappearances and no one had, no police, no police department had decided this might be, this might be connected. Why don't we investigate this further? Or why don't we start a missing persons unit? Nearby in Grace Halanye, another two girls had gone missing. Melissa Russo and Julie DeJure. Again, missing in broad daylight. Just vanished. No trace of them. Six months pass and there is no news of the missing girls. And now in total there have been four girls that have disappeared. Without trace. And these are high profile cases. Let's just think about how many cases that have gone that there has been no publicity about or girls have just been picked off the street, homeless children. We don't know about any of those. We don't know about any of those children whose parents had neglectful parents and who had just disappeared and the parents had decided not to report them missing to police. In 1996, Sabina Dardenne was riding home. She was accosted by a white van. Now this is a high profile case, it becomes a high profile case and this is the one case where the police finally decide to start a missing persons unit. Now 10 weeks pass and again there is no news, the case is going very slowly, it's lagging and there's no, there's no new developments in the case. 14 year old Letitia Dallaire is walking home from swimming and she is snatched off the street. Now this happened in broad day again. Now an inquiry is formed, an an inquiry is started, and a witness reported seeing a white van. Now luckily for this witness, he had noted down the registration number. So he gave the registration number to the police, and the police ran a check to see who that white van belonged to and and whose name it was registered to. Now in total now, this is six girls missing. Now this should be ringing alarm bells, this is connected and if it's not then I do not know what the police were thinking at the time but it's either incompetence 
or they're covering up they're they are covering up for someone and now this isn't unusual for um belgian police now they are extremely corrupt they are notoriously corrupt the van comes back registered to mark dutro his wife michelle martin and an accomplice of his michelle lievre So the police obviously pull these three into questioning and Mark Dutro is not letting up. He's not letting anything slip and he denies all involvement. However, his accomplice, Michel A. Lievre, buckles under pressure and says, yes, we've seen Letitia Delaire. We were we were involved in her um, um, we were involved in her abduction. I was driving the van and Mark would open the door and he would he would push the girl in. Michelle also start, Michelle also broke under pressure and she said, yes, um, I, he, I'm disgusted by what my husband has done. And she tried to distance herself from her husband's actions, from her husband's actions. Now, little did we, little did the police know at the time that this was just the tip of the iceberg. This was just the tip of the iceberg. After extensive questioning of Mark Dutro, he finally let slip that Letitia Delaire was not the only girl that he had abducted and he stated that Sabina Dardine had also been abducted by him. And now the police are absolutely frantic. They get the whereabouts of where these two girls are being held and the chase is on. Will these two girls be found alive or will they be dead? Police reach Mark Dutro's home and there in an underground dungeon the two girls are Sabina Dardine and Letitia Delaire are both found alive and it's an absolute miracle because no one thought they would be found alive the family had given up hope. It had been 11 weeks since Sabina Dardine had gone missing and no one thought that the girls would be found alive. There's an absolute frenzy in the media. There's an absolute frenzy in the media and police and other families of other missing girls all put pressure on the police to start questioning Marta Tro on whether he has been involved in the other disappearances of girls that summer. Now remember... Julie, Julie Lejeune and Melissa Russo. There's two eight-year-old girls that had gone missing. And guess who was involved? Mark Dutro. However, unfortunately, those two girls had been buried in a backyard of one of his houses and they had been starved to death. It was at a time when Mark Dutro had apparently been um, in prison for car theft and he had told his wife, Michelle Martin, to feed the girls in his absence. And um, Michelle Martin had claimed she was too scared to enter the dungeon to feed the girls. And she had let two eight-year-old girls starve to death. This is just so cruel and, and masochistic. I, I don't know how people like this exist in this world. It's absolutely terrifying that monsters like this exist amongst us. There are now two of the missing girls that have been unaccounted for, and that is Anne Marshall and her friend Evier. And they were also found later on, buried in one of Mark de Trolls's backyards. And they had been buried alive. They were drugged and buried alive. In the absolute horror of this case, it just sends chills down my spine. How could one man be this evil? How could one man do this to so many innocent girls, innocent children? It just defies belief. This begs the question, how has Marc Dutro been able to operate for this long 
without any proper investigation into him. How is that possible? This is a man, this is a man who in 1989 abducted and raped five girls. He was imprisoned on a 13 year sentence but was let out three years into his sentence. Now, would you not expect that after all these abductions after 1989, so in 1995, would you not expect that the police would have immediately had their eye on him and had decided, you know, there's only one guy who is probably responsible for these crimes. Let's, let's get a search warrant and check his house. And you know what? He was under police investigation. The police were secretly monitoring his house in 1995. But you know what was extremely convenient for these police officers? They had put a camera outside of his house, directly in front of his house, and it was under a bridge. However, this camera had conveniently only operated between certain times. Now, if you want to catch a pedophile in action, I would assume you would have a 24-hour camera going on, and not a camera with only a limited amount of hours. And it was so convenient that on the day he had abducted two eight-year-old girls, this camera had been switched off. And it was not an operation at that time. These crimes, these crimes could have been prevented. And it just makes you wonder why he was able to do what he was doing for so long. Without any police interference. This is a man whose own mother reported him to police on suspicion of hiding girls in, a, in the dungeons under his house. Now, police thankfully decided to check his house out at the time and they went investigator went along in with a with a locksmith once they were in the house they heard voices or the locksmith heard voices of two children he told the police uh, police officer that he'd heard voices and the police officer said they were coming from outside those voices were those of two eight-year-old girls julie and melissa russo three months later those two girls would be dead. They were two meters away from those from that dungeon. Two meters away. Was this willful ignorance on the part of police officers? Were they trying to cover up for someone? It seems baffling that you would hear a voice at a man who was suspected to be holding girls in his house, and you would not rip that her- house apart looking for some sort of entrance, some hidey hole, or anything. The police also discovered um, video cassettes in his house, and they collected them, brought them back to the police station, and what did they do? Nothing. They did not look at those um, video cassettes. Those video cassettes were cast aside, and their excuse was, we didn't have a video player. Now, I'm sorry, okay, this is just, this is one of the most stupidest excuses I've heard. Those video cassettes had proof of Mark Dutroux either raping girls, they had, it had proof of Mark Dutroux building a dungeon and explaining why the dungeon was being built and how he was covering the door, the door to the dungeon. This sat with the police for over a year, maybe while these crimes were, com- were being committed. Now, I'm just sorry, okay? This just, this just makes me think something is bigger, something bigger is going on over here. The police are protecting someone. They are either protecting an organization. We don't know. Now begins the difficult task of forming a case against Mark Dutro and his com- accomplices. And this is where salacious details will begin, begin emerging from Mark Dutroux himself. Mark Dutroux claims that he is a small man in a bigger picture. He claims to be part of a national paedophile network p- supplying girls or children for the rich people in Belgian society. Influential people in Belgi- Belgian society. Examples include politicians, large corporate businessmen, high profile policemen are all involved in this network. And now, the elites and the upper echelons of society rubbished the claims and said, no, this is just the work of a lone man. However, it did 
make sense to the people of Belgium. Why were girls being why were girls disappearing for this long? Why were police turning a blind eye to all of these disappearances? If not that they were covering one of their own, or they were following the orders of someone up in higher up in the hierarchy, it made sense to a lot of people. A judge, John Mark Conrad, is assigned to the case. Now, John Mark begins with um, finding a group of 11 or 12 victims of uh, Mark Dutroux's, and he also arrests a known accomplice of Dutroux's. And this is a well-known, high-profile businessman in, in Belgium known as Michel Nihou. Now, Michel Nihou was famous for um, many of his many of his rather many of his rather salacious sex parties in Belgium. Twelve victims were also investigated. Twelve victims of Marc Dutroux were investigated for this case. Victim X, Y, and Z, and one of these victims happened to be known as Regina Loof. Regina Loof stated that she'd been sold by her mother's boyfriend to other men for for um, sex at the time when she was a young child. She said it was at these parties that she met Dutroux and Michel Nihou. And these parties were frequented, she said, by politicians, businessmen, policemen. And men would have intercourse with their victims. They would take videos of these children, take photos with these children. And Michel Nihou was known to use these as blackmail against many of the rich politicians in Belgium at the time. There was rumours about it. There was rumours that he would do, that he would use these as blackmail. Now, Regina was met with a lot of scepticism from the detectives investigating the case. Many of them claimed that they were ramblings of a woman who was crazy or sick in the head. Now, they're quite quick to um, lambast a woman, aren't they? They're quite quick to say that these are just tales of a woman who's crazy in the head or sick in the head. However... Regina knew, ca- knew details about Mark Dutroux's life that, she w- that if she was lying, she wouldn't have been able to know. There were specific details about certain things, such as another girl who, would, uh, who was at the time um, also being, uh, at also, who was also made to attend these parties and have intercourse with older men, who had died in their, under mysterious circumstances, she just disappeared to other people and no one knew where she was. Regina Loof told them or gave them the description of where her body was located. Where her, and when her corpse was found, Regina also told them about the manner of her death, how she was dead, the manner in which her hands were tied. And all of those were corroborated with how the autopsy, with how the corpse was found. Now, I don't understand how detectives were so quick to call this the ramblings of a woman sick in the mind. She knew details about Mark Dutroux's life that otherwise no one else knew. And the police were quite quick to shoot her down, which made this all the more suspicious. Now, this case gets even more interesting because Judge John Mark Conrad, who was quite sympathetic to the families of the victims, was sacked by the Department of Justice as a presiding judge in this case. And the reason for this um, dismissal was that he was pictured having dinner with one of the victim's families. Now, at the time, this was a normal, this was, this was normal behavior of judges to have dinner. There were many high-profile cases where judges have been found to have seen having dinner with lawyers, seen having dinner with one of the victim's families, etc. But it was at this point this particular case where the Department of Justice took issue, very convenient in my opinion, and a new judge was assigned to the case. Prosecutors who were investigating the, um, the pedophile network at the time, the claims of pedophile networks, they were summoned to the Department of Justice and they were told to stop their investigation. Why were they told to stop their investigation? They were told there was no need for it. Now, there's all, it's obviously that it, it's obvious that 
the press that the investigators had touched upon or come near to some evidence or some truth and it was detrimental to the detrimental to the lives detrimental to the um the public esteem some of these some of these high profile people might have held after this the belgians were absolutely furious there was a march of huge proportions that have never that had never been seen since probably before the world wars or during the world wars 300,000 people were have said to have marched on Brussels angrily chanting about a cover up and indeed it was a cover up um indeed a cover up in 1996 Marc Dutroux was arrested his trial took place in 2004 Another interesting thing about this case that just sparks more and more the just be, another interesting thing about this case that just alludes to a cover up is that 20 of Marc Dutroux's accomplices 20 had died under mysterious circumstances some of them died on railway lines some of them died by poisoning these accomplices would have been would have been prosecuted these pro these accomplices would have been giving evidence against him in court they would have been giving evidence probably against high profile clients that they that they'd seen and they all died under suspicious circumstances now i can understand one person dying two people dying even three people dying but 20 people dying under suspicious circumstances just speaks of a massive cover-up by police by the forget about police by the department of justice the department of justice obviously seemed to have a lot to lose in this case the police have concluded after their seemingly exhaust exhaustive investigations that there is no reason to believe that there is a pedophile network in belgium and there never has been of course i hope you hear the sarcasm in my voice and mark dutro is currently still in prison um, however, his wife has been released from prison a few years ago, Michelle Martin. And that concludes the case, really. Not a satisfactory ending at all, but that's how it is, especially as you'd understand it's quite similar to the Epstein case. You know, rich people, rich people and people with a lot of influence and money usually get away with murder, quite literally. And thank you for listening to this podcast. I'll meet you all next Friday. Thank you.